All right, hello everyone and welcome to um, the CLE this morning. Our, our topic for today's interactive dialogue segment is the ins and outs of design patents. And, you know, we were really pleased to have sort of an overwhelming response to this topic. We've had over 100 registrants for this morning and we're really looking forward to going through the materials with all of you in this, in this area. Um, it does look like most folks have figured out how to um, get to the audio portion of the webinar as well, so I won't go over that. Not that it would help to talk about that for those of you that weren't connected to the audio. <coughs> um, I'll introduce myself. My name is Jennifer Space. I'm a partner in the patent group at Dorsey. Uh, Dorsey & Whitney is a global law firm with 19 offices, including California, Washington, Colorado, New York, Canada, London, Shanghai, and Hong Kong. Uh, many of those offices include intellectual property lawyers such as myself. Um, you'll be hearing today from Gina Cornelio, a senior associate in our patent group. Um, our Dorsey's intellectual property group is a full-service IP group with patent practitioners, trademark, um, copyright and litigators as well. Both Gina and myself are trained as, as engineers. Uh, we happen to both be electrical engineers, although our patent practices span um, a variety of technologies from consumer products to uh, digital health and other software type technologies. This format um, for our program today um, mirrors some other portions of, of Dorsey that have done this interactive dialogue format in the past. Um, it's a little bit of a different format in that um, we're going for more of a conversation, uh, an interactive dialogue, if you will. Um, we've found that our clients and our contacts tell us that they enjoy speaking with Dorsey lawyers, that they enjoy the advice that is received, and so we're going for more of a, a conversational advice format similar to uh, the counseling sessions that we would have with, with real clients um, that aims to provide really some intelligence behind the advice and go beyond kind of a data overload type of presentation. So the idea is that to, to talk and to create sort of a crossover between an information-packed seminar and more of a talk show type format. So we're gonna see how this goes and we certainly welcome everyone's feedback. We are also um, very interested in and want to uh, incorporate your questions and, and comments into the presentation. If you have comments during the, <clears throat> the the program this morning, please enter those into the chat box that you should see on your screen. Um, Gina and I will see those, the other participants in the call will not, so those will get only to us. Um, and I'll try to uh, bring those to Gina throughout the presentation so that we get you know, your questions answered as well and we're sure to cover material that's of interest to you. Um, you can always, of course, follow up with us afterwards. Our contact information is on the screen and will be provided in, in post-event email correspondence as well. Um, so again, do post any questions online and we'll get to those as we, as we go. So now I'll introduce Gina. As I mentioned, Gina is a senior associate in our patent group. Um, her, her practice has increasingly included um, design patent work, and she and I have collaborated on a number of, of design patent projects, um, including a few in the very recent past, which sort of gave rise to, uh, you know, our, our thought that this would be a good topic um, for, for today's webinar. Um, so, Gina, I'll let you uh, take it from there. Okay, great. Thanks, Jennifer. So, the first question is, why would we pick this topic on design patents? <laughs> Conventionally, design patents were really filed by consumer product type of innovators with article to manufacture. I like to think of these as more of the mechanically based type of innovations. This was the common or conventional thought for when design protection was warranted. 
in the, in the past, software companies typically use utility applications to provide protection for a particular product. <clears throat> And it's actually been my experience that a number of uh, patent attorneys with either a computer science background or an electrical engineering background didn't have a lot of design patent experience until recently. However, since the Supreme Court's decision in Alice, software has become much more difficult to protect using utility patents. I'm sure some of you have had some experience with that, but the examiner examiners have just been a lot more hostile to anything that simply is just a straightforward software utility application directed to, um, to something as simple as a graphical user interface. <clears throat> However, in the 1990s, the USPTO decided that design patents could be used to protect icons and graphical user interfaces. <clears throat> One of the questions before the 1990s was whether an icon or a graphical user interface actually qualified as a statutory subject category, um, which is mainly whether it was an article of manufacture. In the 1990s, the Patent Board heard a case. Uh, it was involved a final rejection from an examiner in a design patent case and essentially came out with the rule that if the icon or the user interface is tied to a display screen, then that counts as an article of manufacture. So since the early 1990s, graphical user interfaces have been protectable using design patents. And with Alice and some other changes in the patent landscape, design patents are now the fastest growing IP asset that's used to protect icons and graphical user interfaces. Therefore, we thought it was a good, a good topic to bring up and it's timely, especially as we'll talk about at the end of the slides the recent Apple versus Samsung litigation that's going to be heard by the Supreme Court shortly. So there are a number of different types of IP assets in a company's intellectual property arsenal. Um, a lot of them are interrelated. <laughs> For example, when a new product is being developed, it may touch every aspect uh, of IP and many may overlap. Structural features, <clears throat> such as the functional elements of a product, may also have ornamental aspects. I'm going to give the example of a, a showerhead nozzle pattern that could be used to provide a special spray pattern that has some great functional benefit. But the spray pattern, or, I'm sorry, the nozzle pattern may actually also have an aesthetic appearance that no, not only would qualify as a design patent, but also in certain instances could also be used as trade dress. So as you'll notice, patents, trademarks, designs, and copyrights all overlap in some instances. However, the, the lone wolf of trade secrets typically doesn't overlap with the others, mainly because the other categories require some kind of public use or disclosure, whereas trade secrets require the opposite and for it to be kept secret. And so Gina, just to, I mean, you've shown these here overlapping uh, a little bit in some way, and, and we've had a, a question as well about whether these certain you know, different types of IP protections um, can coexist or if you need to, to choose one or the other. So you know, here you're illustrating this, this overlapping. So many different kinds of IP can be used to protect, uh, you know, can coexist in protecting a, a single product. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Um, for, I'll give the example of a trademark and a trade dress. So design patent will cover the aesthetic looks of a product, which often can will overlap and determining on the brand strength of the product can require or be awarded trade dress protection. If you think about Coca-Cola's iconic bottle, they not only filed an original design application for that, but I believe they also have trade dress on the, that covers the branding associated with the shape of that bottle. Similarly, <clears throat> with respect to patents, a certain product may have some utility function, but that also will overlap with design and how that product looks. So often all the ones that are overlapping, a particular product may have coverage on each, in each one of the different categories. <clears throat> with respect to utilities and design patents, um, as an initial note, these are not mutually exclusive. As I noted on the last slide, often with a new product, we recommend filing both a design and a utility patent to cover the product. 
However, there are some differences between the two. <clears throat> For example, utility patents protect the, the structure and the works of a product, typically, but not always, the internal guts of a product, whereas the design patents protect the aesthetics or the looks of a product, <clears throat> typically, but not always, the external features of the product. Utility patents have a longer term, so 20 years as compared to the shorter 15-year term for design patents. However, design patents take longer to issuance. It's typically at least one to two years before a utility patent is even examined, and then another one to two years before it issues. This is compared to the short one to two years to issuance for design patents. In my experience, typically design patents are examined after about six months after filing. It's a little bit longer for graphical user interfaces as compared to the conventional mechanical type of products, but they are, in most instances, issued within two years, if not much sooner. <clears throat> Finally, utility patents are more expensive to obtain and, and enforce, <clears throat> whereas designs are typically less expensive to obtain and to enforce. And the big benefit of utilities is clearly that they have a more flexible scope and can often provide broader protection for a particular feature whereas design patents, because they cover the look of a product, often have a narrower scope. And, and so also, Gina, in looking at that, um, if you're going to file uh, uh, for protection under both, both the function of the product and the look, and you're going to use both a utility and a design, um, is that typically done at the same time or um, you know, or at, at different times, and, and what if the, the look of the product changes over time, and how is that kept up with? It's a great question. So there is still the same public disclosure issues with designs as there are with utilities. So if you have a product release and are going to be filing a utility application such as a provisional, you would often need to file a design application on the same day in order to preserve um, the absolute novelty. In the U.S., of course, you get a grace period, but in foreign jurisdictions, um, many of them don't have a similar type of grace period. Um, however, there are certain ways to, because the design covers the look of a product, if often the design, the industrial design for a product is not yet finalized, but the internal guts are, and those are being somehow disclosed either to a supplier or some other way that's not covered under a non-disclosure agreement, what we can do is file a provisional that includes kind of an outside blank shell that doesn't disclose what the product looks like. And in that, you can buy some time to file a separate design application that would cover the, the, the finalized industrial design for a product. Um, and then the other part of your question is what happens if you kind of, I call it the reskinning of a product where the guts will remain the same, but maybe there's a revamp in how the, the product looks. That's the best time to, where design protection can really come in and fill that gap in between whole different product launches, where if you're reskinning the product, keeping all of the internal guts the same, the design can come in and provide that interim cover, coverage. Great. So this next slide shows the typical conventional design applications. These, again, are what I refer to or typically like to think of as mechanical-based um, products. And you'll see on the left is the, the Coke bottle, and to the right is, a, is the car. And so, Gina, we've had a couple of questions about um, the, the availability of different products for, for design patents, and you know, one being um, are design patents available for food products? Yes, they, they are. Um, it, it depends. It'll, again, only cover what the look of a particular food item is, but they could be protected. Um, one thing that we've had some experience in lately is not necessarily the food products, but actually the, the molds or the tools that are used to create a particular shape of a food product. Um, if you think about who who you might want to sue as, as the patent holder, it may not actually be the consumer that's eating the food or creating the food, but actually the, the manufacturer that's creating the molds or the tools that are used to create a particular food product. So often if you have um, an, an example like that, we would recommend filing on the tool that's used to create the particular shape. 
And, and sort of similarly, in, in looking at this Coke bottle here, um, does the design typically include or protect sort of surface printing of the article, or um, are those typically covered by, by trademarks, or what's the interplay with the written uh, materials that might appear on the product? Sure, a, a design patent can cover the whatever is written on the outside of a product. However, typically you would want the design patent to be a little bit broader, and so you would either show what you would have written on the product in dashed lines as a environmental, what could be as part of the design, but not actually forming a part of the claim. However, if you have an instance where maybe the shape of the product itself isn't novel, but you're including some words that you think might help it, then in that case you would want to include the actual words or other um, aesthetic elements that form part of the packaging. Great. So moving on from these conventional design examples, here are some new examples of icons and graphical user interfaces that have been recently patented. Starting at the upper left, you'll see is that iTunes icon for Apple. Next to that is the Windows Media Player. And next to that is, if you're familiar with Uber, is actually the Uber, uh, I believe it's one of the home screens for when you're choosing what type of Uber to take. And then finally at the bottom is a screenshot of the, the navigation screen for a Nissan car. And then looking at these, a couple of things to identify are the different types of drawings that you can present in a design application. And then I want to talk a little bit about the, the different line patterns and what they mean. So looking at the iTunes logo or the iTunes icon and the Uber, you'll notice that these are what are considered black and white line drawings. These are compared to the screenshots that are shown in the Windows Media Player and the navigation screen. The line drawings and actually the screenshots, um, the only part that forms the, the actual claim scope is anything in solid lines. So you'll note there's some different kind of dashed or dashed dot, dotted lines. These merely show the environment for the particular design and don't form any part of the actual claim. So with respect to the Uber screenshot, you'll notice the only thing that's actually claimed is the slider at the bottom that includes the five different circles with the, uh, the middle circle being the biggest. The rest of the part, the map, the, the phone environment, that's all just showing the environment of the design, but doesn't actually limit the scope of the design itself. <clears throat> so as um, some examples, nuts and bolts for how to file these design applications, the requirements uh, at the patent office is that the design may be presented either as a line drawing, such as the, the iTunes logo or the Uber application, or may be presented as a digital image such as the Windows Media Player or the navigation screen. Color and grayscale images are allowed to be presented in the same application. However, color or grayscale images are not allowed to be presented in the same application as <clears throat> line drawings. So for a practice point, if you are interested in receiving kind of overlapping or you know, really beefing up coverage for a particular icon, we would recommend filing two applications. They would have to be filed on the same day so they don't interfere with one another. And one would be filed, for example, let's say you have an icon, file one design that has line drawings with a number of things dashed out or disclaimed to try and be as broad as possible. And a second application that would be an actual screenshot of your icon that may even include color. But I note that color, while it can be included in a design application, will actually limit the scope of the claim so in order to infringe, somebody would likely have to have a similar type of color pattern as the one that you've chosen. And, and so again, with the interplay, Gina, with, with trademark and these design interfaces, and, and particularly now looking at the, the iTunes logo, I mean, um, that would certainly be something that would be available also for, for trademark protection, right, if it qualified. Um, uh, and was applied for under the with the uh, appropriate process there too, right? Right, uh, and you know actually you can include trademarks in a design application. Um, as you you need to indicate in when you file that there is a trademark forming a part of the claim design. What 
would typically mean that either somebody, if they're copying your, your icon, is probably both um, infringing your trademark and your design, but you can include both a trademark and a design application for the same type of icon. Right, and, and then you know, you'd be looking at multiple ways to pursue uh, different uh, an infringer at that point if you're holding different forms of IP that cover that same uh, infringing activity. Exactly. You know, for some, some, sometimes um, depending on the strength of a trademark, a company may not want to risk um, bringing in a trademark action, particularly if it may be a weak or, you know, has a threat of being generic or some kind of uh, other issue. But if you have a design application that is covering that trademark, you could use the design application rather than the trademark in order to stop the infringer. And, and one more note, I didn't include an example here, but you can also protect uh, animated designs using um, the Patent Office, using a USPTO design application. Uh, for animated designs, it's a minimum of two views that are required to show you know, the first stage of the animation and the second stage of the animation. <clears throat> so as we kind of touched on, design patents and utility patents can be used to cover the same product. Here's a great example of that is this is the Apple iPhone, the slide to unlock. They actually have a number of utility patents covering this feature, surprisingly, uh, but on the left is one of one of the basic ones, and then on the right you can see the design patent covering the same element. And you'll note the design patent, you can see again, everything such as the time and the border of the screen, uh, even the slide to unlock and the arrow button are all disclaimed in just environment. So the actual design claim for Apple slide to unlock in this example is just the rectangular bar at the bottom with a rectangular button in, in, the, in the bar. And additionally, this drives home the point of when you have a particular product, filing a design along with a utility application really provides multiple layers of protection. For example, I'm not sure if it's this, um, this utility patent, but I know that one of the Apple's uh, utility patents directed to their slide to unlock was actually found invalid, in which case the design patent, if it's still, if they have one to that feature, will provide the remaining scope of protection for that product. Additionally, because the design will likely grant before the utility, it provides an earlier enforceable protection for the product. Um, and then an, as another note for cost savings, we have had clients that have filed both a utility application and a design in the U.S., but due to the decreased cost of filing a design in foreign jurisdictions, which we'll get to in a minute, we'll only file the design application in any foreign countries. And this provides kind of overlapping coverage in the U.S., but then also allows the client to save money and pursue a design application in some of the bigger countries, but at a reduced expense as compared to utility application. And, and one more note, when you're filing a design and utility on the same product, be sure to confirm inventorship. Um, often utility aspects and design aspects, even for the same product, may have different inventors. Additionally, many companies may use outside industrial design firms for the, the external aesthetics of the design, in which case that might, <clears throat> people from that design firm may actually be the inventors rather than the in-house engineers developing the product. So here's another example of how design, copyright, and trademark um, all cover the same product and they all overlap. This is Google's design patent for their search bar, which you can see, again, everything in Dash doesn't form a portion of the claim design. But they've included the Google word, which is a trademark, <laughs> in, the, in the design application. And also the layout and the software underlying the search function is all copyrighted. So here's a great the Google search, and they also have a number of utilities that cover some of their searching algorithms. So this is a great example of using different types of um, assets in your IP arsenal in order to cover a specific product. And would you, Gina, when filing a, a design and a utility covering the same 
product or arrangement of features, would generally the utility show the, the claim design exactly or would the, the, the utility use different um, drawings to show the, the product in its functional aspects? You know, it, it, it really depends. We've had instances where the utility application will include the same drawings as we'd include in a design. Often you can get a draftsman, if you have the same draftsman preparing both the design drawings and the utility, it'll give you a cost savings by including your design drawings just as your utility um, figures. But in other instances, it may not matter or like I said, if maybe the utility needed to be filed before the design application, they won't necessarily match. But as another good practice point, um, <laughs> this is only allowed in the U.S. Um, I'd have to check on other countries. But in the U.S., you can actually file design continuation from a utility application. So in some instances, we've filed a utility application including drawings that would support a design application and then can file a design application claiming priority to the utility, taking out just those drawings that form the, the design. And Gina, you might discuss this. I, I, you know, we talked about going over this and it, maybe it's a few slides in, but in doing that, in preparing, you know, if you've got a utility application and you think you may do later use that as a design application, you know, are what are the, the the figures that you should be cognizant of? Is it the same old figures that might be usable for the for the utility, or um, are there additional? You know, what what are the kinds of additional figures you'd want to think about including? Sure. So for a, a three dimensional product, so for not for a graphical user interface, there's a standard of seven views that are typically required. Um, there is no requirement at the patent office for any set number of views. It's just that there's a seven, these seven standard views, which I'll go through, are typically the ones the examiners look for. So this would be an isometric view, front and rear views, side views, and then top and bottom views. <clears throat> and depending if the product, you know, has, will look the same from both the left and right side, one of those views can be omitted. On the other hand, for graphical user interfaces and icons, typically only one view, since it's just a two-dimensional representation, is required. Um, so in that case, it's actually a lot easier. And then comparing design drawings to utility applications, the main difference is, one, the different types of lines. You have solid versus dashed, um, as well as typically most design applications include shade lines if it includes a three-dimensional art article that, again, shows the shape and the contours of the product. Most graphical user interfaces, like I said, are going to be a two-dimensional representation, and so they won't have shade lines, and so they're going to be a lot more similar to a utility application, except that they won't have the reference numbers, you know, pointing out the certain types of um, features in the drawing. So <clears throat> I briefly talked about the, that designs can be used to protect incremental improvements in a product. I call this the, the re-skinning type of idea. <laughs> and <clears throat> often, you know, it's easier to get, it's easier to overcome the obviousness hurdle for a design change than it would be for a functional change. So here is a pretty good example of the incremental design improvements that are patentable. On the right, you'll see the prior art, which is a credit card having a magnetic strip on the back and a punch hole through the left bottom corner. <clears throat> And on the left-hand side is the new, improved um, version of the product. And the difference between the two, if you compare the figure, figure five, is that the new claim design it actually has a transparent card or body rather than a solid body. And the Patent Board of Appeals held that this difference in transparency was enough in order to, for the claim, new claim design to receive design protection. So even if you think it's a small change, it's worth talking to um, a patent expert about whether it might be worth filing a design application in order to cover that new improvement. And then how fast do those, I think we, we covered this, this maybe a, touched on it a little earlier, but as you're doing these increments, uh, incremental improvements and, and thinking about filing and getting new patents in the space, what's roughly speaking the, the time between filing and holding an issued design patent? 
Um, it's typically between one to two years, um, faster in the consumer products for whatever reason versus it's a little bit slower in the graphical user interface space. I think just because there's been a rush to the patent office for um, protecting graphical user interfaces and icons, so they're a little bit backlogged. Um, but yeah, I would say a conservative estimate is one to two years from issuance um, between filing which is compared to the four years from filing a design or a utility application. Yeah, great. So we've touched on a little bit, but here's a good list of the benefits of designs over utility patents. Um, one, they're less expensive to prepare and file. Uh, in my experience, design applications are typically 10 to 20% of the, the cost of a utility application. This is because it requires minimal amount of attorney time to prepare. Additionally, typically designs have fewer office actions, and the office actions that do come from the patent office are typically with respect to formalities rather than close prior art. This makes the response, responses less time intensive, that is cheaper, in order to prepare. <clears throat> um, again, as we just touched upon, exam, designs are examined and issued faster, which provides enforceable protection sooner. This is really key for innovations with short lifespans, life spans, typically software apps or you know new kind of home screens and that kind of thing that may change in the next couple of years as compared to a new full um, new product release. <clears throat> and although typically designs are granted within one to two years, um, whereas utilities may take uh, two to four years, I've actually had recently a case where the utility was examined and issued before examination on the corresponding design had even started, but that's extremely rare. In fact, it's my only experience in that in um, as long as I've been practicing. Uh, then another key advantage to designs are the cost for filing foreign. I'm sure many of you know for utilities, typically there's the PCT filing process, um, which the PCT application alone is at least four to five thousand dollars in official fees, and then you have to go into each of the individual countries, translate a lengthy specification, and conform the claims to different requirements for the individual jurisdictions. With design applications, because there is either no specification that's required, or there's a minimal, um, it's really just a description of the figures, the translation costs are greatly reduced. Additionally, many jurisdictions merely register designs. Um, the European Union is a good example. And so there's actually no prosecution cost associated. You won't receive an action, an office action from an examiner on this. And similarly, many jurisdictions, again, the European Union is a good example, allow multiple designs in one application, which reduces the annuities going forward and also allows <clears throat> reduce attorney time because one application can cover multiple different iterations of a product. And then finally, because novelty and non-obviousness, which is required in the U.S., is based on aesthetics rather than function, it's an easier hurdle to overcome. And I know Gina will touch on sort of the damages issue a little bit later in connection with, with Apple v. Samsung, but um, any comments too on enforcement of of design patents and what might be involved there? Is there similar um, claim construction type of headaches as you hear about with utility patents or what's the, do you have some enforcement comments? Sure, yeah, actually enforcement is um, a lot easier and in our experience has been a lot more efficient. We, um, I'll give an example of uh, in Europe, we actually did a really successful letter writing campaign, just so sent cease and desist letters with a copy of the registered designs and because the design is, the infringement standard is more similar to trademark, but it really is, how does it, what does an ordinary observer think, do, is there a comparison between the two? And often if you send it to a person in decision-making authority at an infringing, that's making an infringing product, they're going to look at the design and compare their product and say, yeah, this looks the same, okay, we need to stop. Versus if you send a utility application, now it's what does this claim mean? They got to hire a patent attorney, and it's you know there's always some argument on what on whether the scope is covered and whether it's novel or non-obvious. And designs, it just cuts right to the chase. It's 
here, does the product look the same, yes or no? And like I said, we have found it to be very successful in stopping direct knockoffs. <clears throat> Um, so here's some of the requirements for a design application. Um, as unlike provisional applications, typically designs require a finalized or mostly finalized product. There's no such thing as a provisional design application. Although recently, Jennifer and I have had some emergency designs, which I didn't think were a thing, um, except for the last couple of years. But um, in which case, if you do have that, we, I recommend using Photoshop or trying to play around with different views that you can get using different types of programs to provide good drawings since the good drawings are essential for a design application because that forms the actual claim for, for the asset. <clears throat> uh, another big important thing is that the legal claim for design is the drawings themselves. So you actually want, you want to make sure that the product is illustrated accurately. Um, I've seen, we've had clients come to us where they've had a, they've filed a design application or had one filed and somebody didn't check the drawings as compared to the actual commercial product and guess what, the drawings are different than the commercial product. Now we have to hope <laughs> that any design, that the design would be, you know, an obvious variant of what the commercial product looks like so that our own design patent will actually cover the product. So that requires great attention to detail and making sure, again, that the actual product is illustrated. What if, Gina, we're going to launch with um, three different versions of a product that, you know, look, look different, and, um, but, but we're, we want to test out these three designs in the marketplace, and, you know, we expect to sort of converge eventually on on one final design that will really um, make up the bulk of our sales. Um, can you get all three of those in, in one design application or would you file three applications or how, how would you break up um, different design variants among applications? Sure, so in this case, if you know that you're only gonna go forward with one, but you have three initially you know, that are coming up for a, a public disclosure, I would file all three in the same application. This would reduce the number of patent office fees that you're going to pay, um, such as search fees and filing fees, et cetera. And then hopefully by the time the examiner issues a restriction requirement, um, which typically will happen even in design applications, you'll be at the six month mark and hopefully you'll know then which design you wanna pursue and you can invest uh, in only the one that you wanna pursue. If, on the other hand, you have a whole new product line and you think, you know, all three, they're related and that they have a kind of a common theme, but maybe are going to be marketed, like, in different subsections or, you know, either one's going to be sold online, one's going to be sold in, in stores, for example, I would file those in three separate applications since you're going to want separate protection uh, on each of those different designs. <clears throat> So typically one design, one application. Right, right. But if, you know, like you gave in the first example that you might not want to invest in all three, file one application with th the three different designs and then just pick the one that you want to go forward with. Right. <clears throat> the other thing to keep in mind is that public disclosure is still an issue. Uh, the, the U.S. has a grace period of one year for both utilities and design. Um, a lot of, but a lot of countries have the absolute novelty rule. That said, there are some foreign jurisdictions that have grace period for design disclosures that do not have grace period for utilities. Uh, so if you've had an inadvertent public disclosure and you know that certain countries are going to be uh, knocked off the list for filing utility application, still check on filing a design because cer certain ones have grace periods that don't have them for utilities. The other thing to keep in mind is that the, the foreign priority claim timeline is shorter for designs than it is for utilities. Under designs, it's under the Paris Convention, which is six months. So you have six months from your U.S. priority filing to file in any other countries. <clears throat> and the, the countries that do have a public disclosure, um, it's typically six months rather than a year. And Gina, are there ways to, to consolidate 
foreign filings in groups of countries, or do you need to file in, in each individual um, country of interest? So recently, there's been the Hague Agreement, which allows, it's supposed to type, kind of mimic the PCT process for designs. Um, a Hague filing, you can file one application that then gets, uh, you select which countries that is going to be, that design will be deposited in. Um, in my experience, it hasn't been really any cheaper, and there's not been a lot of benefit to filing a Hague filing. So it, it's a possibility, but typically I would recommend filing in each individual country. The benefit of that that the Hague filing doesn't really offer you is when you're working with local counsel in a foreign jurisdiction, you typically, you'll send them the drawings and you'll get advice before you file the application about any changes they recommend before the application is filed. <clears throat> if you file a Hague filing, typically your U.S. counsel will be doing that and you may or may not know that certain elements are going to be an issue in certain jurisdictions. So, and because it's not, really is that much of a big saver on costs, I just recommend filing into each of the individual countries. And what kinds of differences do you typically see in the, in the requirements and procedural differences among different countries? Um, the, the main thing would be uh, the whether dashing and shading is allowed. As we noted that you can, in the U.S., broaden the scope of your design by disclaiming certain features, including these features in dashed lines. In the number of foreign jurisdictions, dashing isn't allowed, and so you need to include everything, so your claim scope is going to be narrower. And then this is more of an issue for 3D types of objects, but shade lines that illustrate the, the curvature of a particular product are not allowed. For example, in China, they require no shade lines, so it's just straight line drawings. <clears throat> and so these are the types of changes that you can make uh, to a design before filing. Uh, the, the other big one would be making sure that for whatever um, type of product that you have, ensuring that there, the particular country allows protection for that type of product. <clears throat> and um, so would, are those things that you change in the application on filing in those jurisdictions, or do you make do you, do you need to file with those? sort of the end in mind in terms of what jurisdictions will this application eventually be in? So in most jurisdictions, they'll let you conform the drawings to the local rules before filing. However, in order, you know, for the least amount of risk would be to file your U.S. application with those different embodiments. Um, one conservative approach we've been taking lately is we know a number of clients will always file in China. So we include one embodiment that includes no disclaimed portions and no shade lines. And then after filing, file a preliminary amendment to remove that embodiment from the U.S. application. But now our priority U.S. design application has that embodiment in it, and so we know our priority claim in China will be, um, won't have any issues. And to, to that end, you know, if, if you know that you're going to be filing and it, you know, it's going to be a really important product and you know for sure that it's going to be filed in certain countries that maybe have uh, different rules from other jurisdictions, I'd recommend reaching out to local counsel before filing the U.S. application to make sure that your U.S. priority, priority claim to the subsequent foreign application will remain valid. We have a local counsel we work with and they'll do that, you know, for no, they'll take a quick look just to say, hey, you know, I would include this additional element in there just to ensure that prosecution in the, in the foreign jurisdiction will go smoothly. <clears throat> and then turning back to the slide, you know, just following up, the good drawings are essential. It's the whole claim. Working with an experience, experienced draftsman is really key. Trying to fix drawings after the application has been filed is a headache. We've seen a lot of people come to us where they either filed on their own or they filed with somebody who wasn't familiar with designs, and it can make what should be a cheap and efficient application, a design application, much more expensive and a lot more difficult. It's not as easy as a utility to amend the specification or to change the drawings. <clears throat> So we touched on enforcement of design patents. Uh, the, the, the test in the U.S. is the ordinary observer test, and this is similar in a, many other jurisdictions in terms of enforcement. 
and this really does is an analysis about whether the two designs are substantially the same in light of the prior art. And this example here shows um, the design patent for an uh, asymmetric zipper which has a jog in it right up uh, towards the top upper end. And then the alleged infringing product, infringing product is on the right. <laughs> and here it was held that there is no, no infringement because the, the zipper was slightly different. You'll notice that the jog is at a different location in the two as compared to the two designs um, in the in the actual jacket, it's down at the bottom, um, whereas in the design patent, it's up at the right. And additionally, the angles are slightly different. So that's a good example of the ordinary observer test. So on to the biggest news in design patents in quite some time is the Apple versus Samsung. So you may have heard about the case um, after the after the initial jury verdict, and it went up to the federal circuit. Three design patents and two utility patents were um, found to be infringed. Apple was ultimately awarded $548 million after appeal to the federal circuit. And the key thing to note is that $400 million of that was based on 100% of the profits from phones infringing the design patents. So the the three design patents that were found to be infringed are below. Um, starting with the, um, the one on the left, you'll see that the 677 design covers just the shape of the screen itself. Um, everything else is dashed. The 087 is similar to the 677, but also includes the bezel and the, the home button you'll see is um, the round home button is, is included in solid lines. <clears throat> and then finally, the 305 patent is the actual screenshot of the graphical user interface for, for the iPhone. So, you know, going back to the beginning, you know, where we had been talking about the availability of, of different types of protection on a same product and, and kind of why you would use one over the other. And this case in particular, um, you know, really opened people's eyes to the, the damage amounts that were available based on infringement of a design patent as opposed to, you know, maybe infringement of another uh, type of IP that might have covered the product, right? So here uh, they were able to get at the, the profits that from the phone sales directly uh, because of the presence of this design patent. And we'll, we're going to look next at, at what's going on at the Supreme Court uh, and in terms of review of this. But certainly, these these damage, the availability of damages like this are are one reason that that people have been turning to design patents. Yes, that's that's right. Um, so I'm going to flip to the next slide. But the the main the main reason and the questions that are going up to the Supreme Court are when you have <clears throat> based on developments in case law and the statute for utility patent infringement, the 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 patent holder only gets a portion of the profits and basically that portion is what can be attributed to the special or yes the coolness of the particular patented product as compared to a design where the statute actually um, the plain language says that it's the design patent holder gets a hundred percent of the profits um, and so the two questions that are going to the Supreme Court are on the damages aspect for for design patents uh, Samsung wants apportionment and um, not only on the profits limited to the profits attributable to the de protected design feature, but also um, is asking whether a district court should be required to limit the patent um, to, that's protected to the ornamental sco scope. Um, Samsung's view is that damages should be limited to the value of the design aspects, whereas Apple's view is the plain language of the statute. Um, for example, the utility patent infringement statute has been modified, whereas the design statute has not been. <clears throat> and I've included a link um, below. Brad Hattenbach, who's an attorney here, has written a great, uh, it makes patent law funny, which is not typically a thing, um, on the, the TMCA blog. So he has a really great detailed analysis of the two questions and um, the issues involved at the Supreme Court. Uh, so let's look at that. First question, Gina, where 
um, we're talking about the design patent including uh, unprotected non-ornamental features. And I know you said at the beginning, you know, certainly design protection is available for ornamental features. So how is it that the design patent comes to include these non-ornamental features? Sure. So some, some features are driven by function, which is really the test. Um, and I'm not quite sure how it would be in practice in order to, um, for a, a court to kind of sparse through what features are driven solely by function and which ones are ornamental, because often it's a combination of the, the two. Um, but that if you have a shape or um, a particular feature that really its shape is driven solely by function, then that would um, have to be kind of carved out from the design, the design itself. And we've seen this type of, of apportionment, of course, happening um, in utility patent cases, you know, for quite some time. I'd say, you know, the issue even in utility patent cases um, can be thorny in, in terms of how to do the apportionment and, you know, whether or not at the end of the day you really achieve uh, the, the type of apportionment that, that you think of when you kind of go into it. Um, and so, you know, here would there, you know, where there had been no apportionment at all, you know, it seems like uh, the ask, you know, is it Apple's ask that some type of apportionment be used to allocate the, the, the profits as between, you know, that's, that's only attributable to the design or what does that look like? Well, you know, how would the apportionment happen in practice? Yeah, the apportionment would end up being a battle of the experts, um, similar to utility uh, patent infringement lawsuits where now you need to have consumer surveys and different types of evidence that show people were drawn to this product because of this functional feature. In designs, it would be uh, Apple would then need to show, for example, that people were drawn to Samsung's phone because of the design aspects rather than the functional aspects of the phone, i.e., the Samsung's curved corners and shape of their screen and as well as the layout of their icons was the reason a consumer chose the product as opposed to, hey, it's a smartphone that has a touch screen that gets email and can send text messages. Um, so it'll make it more difficult to, once again, it'll really depend on the strength of a particular expert as well as the types of evidence that each side can produce. Right. Yep, and I was just going to say, well, I think that's, that's it. I think that's brought us to the, the end for today. Um, everyone should have received uh, a sign-in sheet that would be, uh, that, that you'll need to complete if you're looking for CLE credit for the program. Uh, we, those should be returned to Michelle Hubble, whose uh, email address is here. Um, although, uh, if you send them to either of us, I'm sure we will get them to the right place. Um, there's CLE available in a number of jurisdictions, uh, and and that can you know that'll be communicated out to you as well. If we were unable to apply in advance for CLE in your in in your jurisdiction of interest, um, you will also be sending you a copy of the program materials that you can use. Um, to apply in your own jurisdiction for CLE credit, um, and you can go about it that way. Um, like I was saying, we do um, conduct these interactive dialogues in uh, various different groups of the firm. You may have participated in, in some of our employment law interactive dialogues. Uh, we'll also be conducting an interactive dialogue on an IP topic quarterly. Uh, the next IP topic will be the efficient resolution of patent disputes uh, that I'll speak with my colleague Case Collard on different mechanisms to achieve efficient resolution of your patent disputes um, as more and more people are looking to avoid expensive and very protracted patent litigation. So we'll take a look at um, that exciting area of counseling as well. Uh, Gina and I 
Um, of course, are happy to answer any additional questions or speak to anyone who'd like to talk about uh, design patents in greater detail. So please also feel free to reach out to us and thank you all for attending today.